thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, this is Dr. Ian Belfour Lynn. He's one of the consultant respiratory paediatricians um, at the Royal Brompton and at Chelsea and Westminster. Um, and he's kindly going to give us a talk on the management of complicated pneumonia. Um, if you have any questions, if you could put them in the chat during the talk and we will have some questions at the end. Otherwise, if you can keep yourself muted for the talk, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Ian. Okay, so hopefully, yeah, thank you very much and uh, welcome. I'm sitting at home, which is very nice for me. Um, so this is about management of complicated pneumonia. My practice is principally at the Royal Brompton, which, as you know, is tertiary quaternary unit, but also at Chelsea Westminster, which is more of a sort of secondary care. Are you on? Okay. So the first thing is, uh, what do you do? Well, obviously antibiotics. I'm just going to check. Didn't skip. Yeah, antibiotics is quite clearly the mainstay for pneumonia treatment. And that's because you don't know if it's a virus or a bacteria. And there's no study or test that's ever properly shown the difference there. And so you have to assume a child with pneumonia has got bacterial pneumonia. Therefore, everybody essentially needs antibiotics. The good news is that for over a decade now, since there was a very important study called the PIVOT study, it showed that oral was essentially as successful as intravenous for the majority of cases. Um, and that clearly means you don't have to put drips in children all the time, which is very nice. And also they can often go home. Um, who does need intravenous? Well, obviously if they can't tolerate oral fluids. If the child is vomiting, don't think, oh, it'll all be okay when they're at home. No, it won't. It just means they'll be at home vomiting the antibiotics, possibly getting dehydrated as well. The child is obviously septic and really quite unwell with it. Or if there's complicated pneumonia, which is most of what this talk is about, what we tend to use is intravenous carmoxiclopine for standard pneumonia uh, with oral azithromycin because you cannot forget mycoplasma, one of the commonest causes of standard community acquired pneumonia, and therefore there's no point in waiting to see if they get better from the standard you know, carmoxiclopine. Go for oral azithromycin. Different trusts will have different antibiotic policies. Why I like Comoxclav is it also will treat anaerobes as well, and you do get uh, anaerobic chest infections. So the British Thoracic Society had community acquired uh, pneumonia guidelines, which were updated a little while ago. And in it, the number one, this is for oral treatment now, is amoxicillin. And I think that's reasonable because most children, it will, you know, the GP will give amoxicillin and they'll get better. And they say, if no response to first line, use the macrolide. This is the bit I'm not sure I completely agree. I am sure on principle, it's right to restrict use of antibiotics and all this antibiotic stewardship, etc. But actually, why wait two or three days, a child's not better, and then you give them the azithromycin? So I would actually add that in at the beginning or just use a macrolide, which I probably shouldn't recommend to you. But amoxicillin, they do give alternatives, coamoxiclav, which generally works better than amoxicillin on its own, or kefaclor. Forget erythromycin, I put that in brackets. No one should ever use that. It makes children vomit, gives them stomach aches. You might as well just use azithro once a day for three days, very successful. Uh, GPs quite often use chlorithromycin. I don't know if it's cheaper than azithro, but it's a good drug as well. So personally, I would give azithro once a day for three days or carmoxiclap for five to seven days. That's the child with a sort of fairly straightforward chest infection. Now, what I'm not going to discuss today is where um, there is a known underlying diagnosis of chronic subjective lung disease, meaning cystic fibrosis or PCD or bronchiectasis, or in the situation of immunodeficiency, and opportunistic infections, or ventilator-associated pneumonia, which is a whole different story. Now, why can pneumonia be complicated? It may be complicated because it's so severe, i.e. it's just very bad. And in fact, it's quite old, actually. I see the BTS um, guideline in 2011. They define severity by some clinical signs. Saturation is less than 92% or cyanosis, or I wouldn't expect a child to turn up with cyanosis particularly. Uh, respiratory rate over 50 a minute, tachypneic, uh, 
Se severe difficulty breathing, grunting, nasal flaring, high temperature, uh, sort of signs of sepsis with capillary um, refill time greater than two seconds, or obviously, sorry, let's just dismiss that, things might pop up on my screen, um, or dehydration. And for an infant, it changed a little bit by the respiratory rate being above 70, counting as severe, or other things you often see, recession, apnea, poor feeding. So those are kind of definitions of what makes something severe. And it's usually related to the organism. This is why it's bad. For example, invasive pneumococcus, you certainly you'll see a lot of CT scans and things of pneumococcal invasive pneumonia. PVL staph aureus, that will make you very sick, as will group A streptococcus or adenovirus. Those are the sort of bugs that I'm, you know, I will see more often in our sort of practice. Double pneumonia, very old term, meaning it's bilateral. And there's no question, if you've got signs on both sides, the children are sicker and inevitably will need oxygen at least. If it's very bad and they end up in PICU, obviously we would try non-invasive ventilation, preferably to mechanical ventilation. Sometimes they end up on an oscillator. Uh, the only thing to tell you about PICU care of pneumonia is permissive hypercapnia. In other words, you allow the CO2 to be go up, to go up higher than you might normally, so that you're not really inflicting damage to the lungs with high pressures and ventilation. And usually it's single organ failure, uh, just the lungs, and they get better. Um, if you're running into other problems like renal failure or, you know, blood failure or anything else, you know, that's going to make the situation definitely much worse. Children do still die. I haven't updated this recently, but it's very difficult to find the statistics. This was England and Wales in 2010. Um, 20 deaths roughly under one year of age and about the same for one to four. Much fewer above five years of age. Of course, what you don't get from this kind of statistic is under, you know, uh, morbidity, pre-existing morbidity. You know, were they all do they have other significant conditions? But nevertheless, people do still die of pneumonia at all ages. And it's always, to me, a bit of a shock that that might happen because you just imagine with antibiotics, that should really never happen nowadays. And male, female equivalent uh, rates. There may be other complications of pneumonia which nothing to do with the lungs. For example, septicemia, including metastatic uh, septicemia. It may go into ARDS acute respiratory distress syndrome, in which case those children will definitely be ventilated. Uh, fluid balance can be an issue. Um, inappropriate ADH secretion, uh, you'll probably be familiar with that. Often if someone's got pneumonia, you will reduce the fluid intake from 100% down to usually about two thirds, because otherwise everything dilutes and the sodium plummets down. You can get hemolytic uremic syndrome. It's not common, but it does happen. And finally, secondary thrombocytosis, where the platelets got very high, over a million. Um, it doesn't actually tend to cause problems, having said that. You don't tend to get clotting issues. Now, they may not be getting better, failing to improve. This is a common situation, usually about five o'clock on a Friday, when the consultant's doing a ward round before the weekend and discovers someone who's actually been admitted with pneumonia six days ago, with a swinging fever, still needing oxygen. Um, I'd like to think that this should not work. Well, this should definitely not happen. Um, but it is astonishing how many phone calls you get late on a Friday um, referring somebody who's clearly not getting better because they've got an empyema, for example. So what may be going on? Well, they may still be septic because you've got the wrong antibiotic. No one's fault, but it happens to be resistant to what you're giving. Or maybe you're not giving enough and the dose hasn't been calculated properly. What we sometimes suggest is adding in an aminoglycoside like tobramycin, which we tend to use, once, well, we always use once daily. It's interesting, quite often adding in that really makes a difference and suddenly they turn the corner. Or clindamycin, another drug that's often used. Is it something else? Is it TB? TB can sneak up on you and, and can present as an acute pneumonia where there seems to be an initial response um, but then you're left with the chronic problem, uh, i.e. you're there days later and they know better. And it turns out actually they've got TB after all underlying. There may be a new diagnosis, for example, of an immunodeficiency or bronchiectasis or a congenital thoracic malformation or something else. 
obviously these things don't ha that doesn't happen very often or it may simply be there are complications and that's what we're going to go through now is the main part of the lecture how often do complications occur well there used to be an annual bts run pneumonia audit that would take place for a few months every winter i think it's stopped now um, they rarely reported results but there was a report from 2010 and 11 in 77 hospitals with over 2,000 cases so useful data because it's large um, half of them were under three no difference boys and girls in terms of severity in the less than one year olds, the respiratory rate was greater than 17, 10%, and the great older ones, it was 25% had a were tacking near to that level. As you can see, 38% had low SATs, only 3% were ventilated, so it's a small proportion. And complications, empyema was by far the commonest at four and a bit percent. Next was abscess at about one percent, and there are some others. So as you can see, generally, it goes very well. And we're talking about a small percentage ventilated and a relatively small percent, about 7%, who had actual complications. Now, the acute complications can be divided into fluid, air, or collapse, atelectasis. And fluid can be abscesses or empyemas, stroke, perineumonic effusion. Air may be a pneumatocele or more severe necrotizing pneumonia due to air leaks or there may be collapse of a lobe. So starting with a lung abscess, this is defined as fluid, which obviously is pus, inside a cavity that's more than two centimeters in size with a defined wall within the lung tissue itself. Very often there's an air fluid level, which makes it easy to diagnose on a chest X-ray. Um, Commonly, you get anaerobes in 70, 90% of occasions, although having said that, we don't stick needles in to actually see what's growing. And if you, if you are getting an anaerobic infection, is the child aspirating? Is that why? Um, I hope you can still, I've got a little message about internet. Hopefully you can still hear me anyway. Is the child aspirating, i.e. unsafe swallow, or is the child with cerebral palsy who clearly uh, can't swallow properly? They can be single or multiple, variable size. And in the majority of cases, you'll see it on a simple X-ray. Sometimes you may need a CT scan. I mean, who are you going to CT? Well, we'll talk about that a bit more with empyemas, but generally if somebody's not doing well and you can see they've got a pneumonia, you may need to consider a CT or, or if, if there's a suspicion of that on the X-ray. And they need antibiotics for a long time. IV for two or three weeks usually, followed by oral for the further four to six weeks. And in a vast majority, it gets better. 80 to 90% of cases will just get better with time, patience, and antibiotics. Um, we don't, as I say, stick needles in because that leaks the pus into the rest of the lung tissue. Um, but if the child is ventilated with a massive uh, abscess pushing the heart across, then you may actually have to put a drain into it, usually under CT guidance. Um, and if you do have an abscess, when the dust has settled, think, is there an underlying issue? Is there a cavity there in the first place that became infected, such as a congenital thoracic malformation? Those are normally picked up antenatally nowadays, but since we treat them conservatively, usually, um, there may be a cavity there, or rarely an aspergilloma in somebody um, particularly with an immunodeficiency. There's an example. You can see pretty obvious large abscess, air fluid level with the arrow, so it makes it more obvious. This child, interestingly, had a, was one of my patients I had discharged. <clears throat> had an asymptomatic CCAM, and 11 years later, presented like this. So obviously the antibiotics were treated locally, and then, the, and then we did a lobectomy because if you get a CCAM that's become infected, it can certainly happen again. Um, here's another example of a right upper lobe abscess. Again, fairly obvious that. Do you need to do a CT? Not really. If that child's getting better, you know the diagnosis. I mean, you can see on the CT, yes, it's a very nice picture, but does that tell us anything more? Not particularly. And here it is six weeks later, you can still see where I'm arrowing the faint outline rim there of the abscess cavity, although clearly the infection's gone. And I guarantee if you uh, re-extrayed that a few months later, that would be completely normal. 
Here's an example of a kind of multi-lobed type of abscess. Uh, it's a CT view. You can see it quite well on the coronal views from the CT. You can see what it looks like. It's pretty horrible looking. And there it is on the other view of it. So moving on to empyemas, this is where you have fluid, which here can be pus or serous clear fluid between the lung and the chest wall, i.e. it's within the pleural cavity. You can usually tell on an x-ray if that's where it is, but not always, in fact. Um, chest x-ray is what you need and an ultrasound. And you definitely need an ultrasound. Any of you working in a place where you've made the diagnosis, you request the ultrasound, and the radiologist says, you don't need an ultrasound, I can see it on the x-ray, rubbish, you need an ultrasound. And one of the reasons for that is we get referrals, not in, you know, sometimes if you haven't had the ultrasound, and it looks like a whiteout, and actually what it turns out to be is just a very severe pneumonia, and it's all collapsed and consolidated, and there's no fluid there. You do not need to do a routine CT chest for an empyema, as long as everything's going well. So it's not to say we never do it, and we do do them sometimes. That's when we're not winning with simple treatments. You need IV antibiotics until they're no longer septic. <clears throat> and usually we would carry it on for about 24 hours after the drains come out. And then we send them home and oral antibiotics for two weeks. We tend to use carmoxiclab still. We have sometimes used ketriaxone. Um, we, uh, but Kermoxtab is our first line, really. Clindamycin gets used sometimes as well. And for their oral antibodies to go home, it's always Kermoxtab. They need analgesia. It's uncomfortable. It's difficult to take a deep breath if you've got fluid there and with it a pleuritis or pleurisy, which is inflammation of the pleura, which when you cough or take a big breath is rubbing against the chest wall and causes pain. And if you've got good analgesia, they'll breathe better, move better, and that will help. Now, many of them need a chest drain. If the fluid is greater than two centimeters, this is your rough guide, it's likely we will put a drain in, but not necessarily. So for example, if we get referred the child and they've only been in hospital for 24 hours with antibiotics, we might give it a bit longer. Um, or if they've starting antibiotics actually clearly really well and the temperature seems to come down. Again, we won't automatically put a drain in. I suspect we are a little bit more conservative than we used to be, say, 10 years ago and put less drains in than we used to, because we like to give it a little bit of time to be certain it's necessary. But if the child is in oxygen, no question we're going to do the drain, or if there's mediastinal shift, we'll put a drain in, or if they're just not getting better with swinging fevers to 40 degrees. When we put the drain in, it's always done under general anaesthetic. Um, I know you can do it under sedation. I wouldn't let someone do it to me under sedation. Uh, I don't believe if, just because you're 14 or 15, you should be put through that process. Because under the anaesthetic, we then take bloods. We'll put a long line in because they may need IVs for a, a length of time. We will also um, usually use fibrinolytics, namely intrapleural urokinase. This is to do two things. Partly it breaks down the loculations within the uh, pleural cavity, but also fluid has to be reabsorbed itself by the body with a little pores on the outside of the chest, well, inside the lung, obviously, sorry, inside the chest cavity on the lining. Um, and that gets bunged up uh, with gunk. And that's where the fibrinolytics help. So here's a few examples. So that's quite clearly a big whiteout. Now, you don't know if that's pneumonia only or if there's fluid unless you do an ultrasound. Here, it's a little bit more obvious. You can see a line there on that picture below to suggest it's fluid. Here, you can see a rim up the, a line like that. Would I put a drain into this child immediately? Not necessarily, depending on how big that's, that fluid is. Um, here's another example similar. You can see there that's definitely going to need draining. Look at the size there of the, in fact, I think there is a drain in there actually, but you can see the size of the, oh, sorry, go back up. Um, the picture in the middle is just pneumococcus because that's by far the commonest bug that you would get in the UK. These are ultrasounds, always difficult for us non radiologists to interpret, but what you can certainly see here is strands of fibrin across the cavity. 
and the issue here is if you put a drain into that bit, the bit over, well, that's probably the liver, but the bit over there won't necessarily drain. And um, that's why you will need fibrinolytics. We use soft um, uh, pigtail catheters. The reason for that is that it curls, you can see there it curls around, so there's less likely an end to poke into um, the pleura and cause a pneumothorax. Our surgeons in the old days used to use these big drains, bigger than a pencil, and then you'd be left with a child who's very uncomfortable, doesn't move, uh, sits tilted over. We then used to use these smaller drains, <coughs> excuse me, which work just as well. Fluid, even thick fluid, will come down a small drain. When you actually need a big drain is air. You've got a pneumothorax and you're using a small drain or a pigtail, they often kink and the lung immediately collapses down again. Nowadays, actually, our radiologists do this. It's no longer done by the respiratory pediatricians themselves. What you might get out is thick pus like this, and this is blood stain probably from the pr procedure, or it might be this very thin serous fluid. Interestingly, the serous fluid often are the ones that give you the bigger effusion. Um, Oh, I think somebody coughed. Uh, a bigger effusion that will get better quickly. I'm not sure who's not muted. Can you make sure you're all muted? Because there's some big noise going on. Um, and here you can see this is the Seldinger technique that we used to do, um, and now the radiologists do. There's often been a debate about medical versus surgical. In other words, should you do a thoracotomy? Should you go straight in there and operate rather than just do a drain yourselves? And if you're going to do surgery, should you do a VATS procedure versus an open operation? The advocates of surgery, which is principally Birmingham and Newcastle, <clears throat> will say that the children get home quicker, they recover faster. But if you said to a parent, would you like a procedure with a little drain going in or would you like a whole scar and a big operation? Most would rather you did the minimal treatment you can. Of course, the problem is, what you can't predict is the ones that are going to end up needing surgery two weeks later because it's not gone well. And there's nothing that's allowed us to be predictive of that. Most of them go very well in a home at five, six, seven days, that kind of length of time. So each tertiary unit needs to be good at what they do and have an agreed policy and try and get unbiased informed consent from the family. <coughs> the important thing is they tend to all get better anyway. And this is a big difference from adults with empyemas who will often have an underlying condition and actually have a genuine mortality attached to it. Here's, well, here's some examples. You see, this is what it looks like when you do a VATS procedure. And you can see there this thick fibrous membrane, which you can see below. And you wonder if that would ever actually dissolve and go away, but it does. This is surgery, which I think that's a rib there. I've never quite worked out what's going on in this, this operation. What I can tell you is open thoracotomy is a very bloody difficult operation, including doing a decortication if that is necessary. So we would much rather avoid surgery if we can. Why is it such variable practice? Well, this was the 2005 BTS guidelines on empyema. They've not been updated. It's 15 years old. I would say there's very little extra to add since then anyway. But you can see so when we looked at 165 levels of evidence quoted, 107 were grade three, which means case reports or case studies. Very, very few randomized controlled trials of treatment. And when we look at grades of the SEP57 recommendations, <coughs> 46, the vast majority were grade D. That meant case reports, case studies or expert opinion. So it's an area of remarkable uh, lack of evidence. One of the good bits of evidence was the Eurokinase uh, multi-center study that was done in the UK, which is was positive and which is why we use Eurokinase regularly. Now, it's not always an infection. This is really important. You get the x-ray, people assume it's pneumonia and an empyema. So on the left was an example of a pericardial effusion. There was no pleural effusion here and um, you can actually see the outline of the heart on the right and on the left actually goes right to there. In this case, the CT scan, 
you know, what's missing? Well, the heart's missing, and that's because that giant big white thing was the heart. Um, this was a case sent to us where the radiologist said to the pediatrician, I can put a, a drain into that empyema. Pediatrician fortunately said, I think I'll refer them to the Brompton. And I, I can just remember it very well because I remember saying to parents, well, we don't think it's an empyema. And before I could kind of finish the sentence, they were busy saying, oh, good, oh, good. But obviously it's not good to have cardiomyopathy. The child did actually survive, but was in intensive care for a while. The question you will always be asked if you're referring a patient like this, and you must always know and ask yourself anyway, is what is the white count and what is the CRP? <clears throat> the absolute standard, you know, pneumonia causing an empyema, the white count will be 25 to 30 and the CRP will be up to 300, that 250, 300, that sort of figure. When people start telling us the white count is nine and the CRP is four, then we think, oh dear, this will not be a bacterial empyema, this will be malignancy. Possibly TB, but usually malignancy, to be honest. And this top picture was the same child, um, in fact, did have raised white count and CRP, but took a long time to get better. And once the drain was, fluid was coming off, we were left with this mass, turned up with lymphoma. And actually, you, of course, you can get secondary bacterial pneumonia with an underlying uh, malignancy. This child here um, had, a, had a neuroblastoma. And it was awful. It was bilateral. Uh, you can see all this white stuff. It's pretty upsetting as a neuroblastoma. This one on the right turned out to be a sarcoma. So every year we probably have one or two malignancies diagnosed this way. This example was a bilateral empyema in a very overweight child. The reason I'm saying the child was overweight is because it was hard to examine the abdomen. And what was unusual here is it was bilateral. Empyemas are very rarely bilateral. And the fluid just kept pouring out. It was tons on both sides. And then um, he was being re-evaluated after a few days and the registrar cleverly felt a mass in his abdomen around the um, Hence, he had a plain abdominal x-ray up here, and you can see there's something there pushing the bowel aside. And then, obviously, one thing led to another. And here is the CT of his chest with a Burkitt's lymphoma. It turned out to be eroding here, here. Uh, it was there, there, and he had this pelvic mass outlined by the four asterisks. Um, and he did quite well, actually, with chemotherapy and everything. But it's always a lesson. Think, is it, you know, always think, is there something else going on, particularly if people aren't getting better in the expected way? This um, was a chylothorax. Now, chylothoraces do happen <clears throat> often post cardiac surgery because the thoracic duct can be uh, damaged, but obviously you know about that. And occasionally in a neonate, you'll get a spontaneous chylothorax. It may be due to underlying lymphatic disorder. Um, sometimes it just happens on its own. And this is an example of somebody got tapped and out came the milky fluid and you've got your diagnosis. Just beware in a young, like in a neonate, if the child is not being fed, is on TPN, for example, then it won't be milky. It'll look clear. Um, and that's a trap you can fall into. So moving away from fluid now to air, a pneumatoseal. This is air inside a thin walled cavity that's inside the lung parenchyma, but there's no fluid, otherwise it'd be an abscess. It's just an air filled cavity with a thin wall. Um, it's usually associated with Staph aureus or Streptococcus. It can be large or it can be very large. In fact, if it's near the surface, it can pop and they can have a pneumothorax. And the thing to do is leave them alone. Obviously you'll treat the underlying infection, which you may have already done. And this may be a late thing that you've noticed. Um, leave them alone. It may take many months to resolve. Now, usually it's a couple of months only, but we've seen them over a year still present. Of course, at that stage, we would definitely done a CT scan to be certain it's not an underlying CCAT and whether it's actually a genuine pneum pneumatoseal. Um, now, this is some examples. This child had PVL staph aureus and was really very ill. Uh, so this was 19th of December. Um, you can see things going on there. What then appears looks like an abscess there, but also you 
it's not that clear there because much clearer on this film here, which I've enlarged and had a CT scan. You can see the time course in inevitably over Christmas and New Year um, and looked pretty horrible there. But inevitably with conservative treatment at that stage, here we are in clinic several months later with a completely normal chest x-ray. Uh, you really can't see anything anymore. It's disappeared. Um, here's another example. Um, you probably can see something going on there. Is it there? No, that's probably a bit of normal aerated lung. In fact, it's there. Uh, it's a bit more obvious there. Uh, now, this was six months later and it was still there. And we were beginning to think, mm, is this really a pneumatocele? Uh, and therefore the child had a CT scan here, which confirmed that's what it was. And here we are now over a year later, but it has gone. Now, I don't know why the child had a repeat CT scan. That, to be honest, completely unnecessary. Um, but they did. But anyway, the X-ray itself showed it was fine. I can't think, unless there was doubt from the radiologist who said we need to do a CT. I'm not sure why that was done. Now, necrotizing pneumonia, which is a big deal. They may have severe sepsis, but actually they don't always. And it also it doesn't necessarily appear at the very beginning. Um, and what happens is you get a thrombosis of the intrapulmonary vessels, and then you get a bit of ischemic damage to an area of lung tissue. It necroses and you get a cavity formed, and then the air leaks out the lung into the space with a bronchopleural fistula, meaning it's going to keep leaking out. It's not just you put a drain in, the drain will bubble like almost forever. And you can get a pneumothorax with that or a pyopneumothorax where there's pus inside it as well. And it takes ages to get better. And serotype 3 pneumococcus was the big one that we had a lot of these cases over a few winters when we found they were getting serotype 3. Now that is included in the uh, pneumococcal vaccination, which is good. So that's not so, so common anymore. Staph and Klebsiella also known to do it. Here are some examples. You can see it looks terrible. You've got a big fluid level there, loads of pus, infection, you know, just air, free air. And you have to be very patient. And here it is a month later, um, improving, not normal. But six months later, look, look at that, that's a clinic. Extra. If this was an adult, they'd never even reach the six months, they'd be dead because actually it's very severe in adults compared to children. You need prolonged antibiotics, and it, we're talking sometimes two months easily, and sometimes in the hospital for a long time. We keep the surgeons away. Certain places like to operate, they think I'll bring up a muscle flap and I'll plug off that hole. And to be honest, you're better staying out of there because if you go in, the surgeon goes into this situation, often the lung tissue just falls to bits in their hands and they end up doing lobectomies and things. They usually need a drain and it may be many weeks and we will tend to use a larger drain in these instances because there's air and air, as I said before, we don't want the drain to kink. We avoid fibrinolytics, we don't use urokinase because we actually want fibrin plugs to plug up the hole and you have to be patient and if the parents are, it's easy. And if the parents are angst and going on your back, it's a nightmare because this thing go on for weeks. But they do do very well overall. You know, the outcome really is very good. Here's an example. So this was, looked like, okay, standard empyema, pneumonia should get better. Clearly, four days later, it wasn't. And a few days later, it was even worse because by then you've definitely got air leaks. You can see here in retrospect that was those little bits of air there were probably air leaks um, and you can definitely see it there. And then it seems to get even worse nine days later. Look at that. It's appalling. Look at the CT scan. It's like a dog's dinner. It's a bad idea to CT because it just upsets you. And in this case there was also you can see uh, subcutaneous emphysema here. Um, but gradually things got better and this was pneumococcus. Here is another child. I mean, you, you already know from the beginning it's, it's looking bad there. Uh, but this is, you know, th nearly three weeks later. CT is it's appalling, isn't it? Uh, it just looks terrible. And here we are a month later. X-ray still looking pretty bad, needing IV antibiotics. But hey, one month after that, suddenly you're really winning. You can still see a little line there, a bit of fluid. 
and this is later on in clinic, with a remarkable X result actually. It's a remarkably good X-ray compared to the stuff, you know, how it's been. Right, I'm moving on to the final part, which is about atelectasis. Um, now, atelectasis acutely may be due to mucus plugging, and very often physiotherapy is all you need. And uh, sometimes you need a bronchoscopy. Here's an example. Inevitably, I've given you my best example of collapsed post cardiac surgery. In fact, those of you notice might see an abnormally shaped heart. And we did a bronchoscopy, and this was the result. And we all sort of thought, aren't we clever? The truth is, very often you do a bronchoscopy and you do absolutely nothing. It does not help at all. If there's really thick mucus, you obviously would need to think of cystic fibrosis. Now, that really shouldn't present nowadays with screening since 2007. I wouldn't expect to present this way. Could there be a foreign body? Is there something down there that's, that's led to chronic atelectasis? Or is there airway compression, particularly lymph nodes? Is it TB? These are things you have to consider. Um, here's an example of somebody who had everything. So he started out with an empyema in January. Look, look how long, this is March. He was still in the hospital, really quite unwell. Now, in this instance, you think, God, if only we'd operated on this thing in January, we wouldn't have had all these problems. And that may be true, but the problem is you can't predict who that's going to be. There was then this large thing which turned out to be a pneumatocele, which was good. And the final result was there was this dense area of atelectasis, which is a posterior segment of the right upper lobe. You can see here. Now, you have to be careful here. This is a thing to a lesson. Sometimes the right upper lobe pneumonia, you think, oh, that's good, it's getting better, it's getting better, when actually it isn't. And what's happening here, although it was only a segment in this case, is actually it's collapsed completely. And this is the right upper lobe, all of it there. And that's just a warning that can happen. Anyway, we elected to leave this alone. You know, that bit of lung was never going to open up, and certainly we weren't going to operate. If you have an abnormal chest x ray at follow up, even though the child is well, you think of atelectasis and chronic. Is the lumen blocked? As I say, mucus plugging, foreign body, polyp or tumor. I've had more than one occasion, like a right upper lobe pneumonia. Child got better, x ray never did. And you end up doing CT bronchoscopy, and there was polyps there that needs then surgical reception. I mentioned is the lumen compressed, lymph nodes, tumor, vascular structure. Is there a vascular ring? Is it narrow, the lumen, because of bronchomalacia? Sometimes right middle lobe bronchus, it's the commonest one to have a problem because if you look at the right middle lobe, it's a slit. It's narrower than all the others in the first place, so it doesn't take a lot for it to be compressed even further. And if there's a consolidated area, consolidated area, is it congenital thoracic malformation? Is there actually a tumour? And here are a few examples. This top left is a sputum plug. It happens to be from a child with CF just because I wanted a good example of thick sputum. This was a foreign body, uh, looked like a tooth. We thought it was a hamatoma. Turned out to be a toy soldier that had been swallowed and eroded through and he had a tracheosophageal fistula with the soldier poking through. Uh, obviously unusual. Here is a, a hard lump of TB plaque. So that lobe is never going to open up and here's an example of the right upper lobe and you can't see it very well but basically there was a spindle cell tumor and obviously the infection they get is then secondary because mucus is being retained behind the tumor as the tumor is enlarging so to conclude most pneumonia is easily treated do think about pneumonia and the bit that gets missed is left lower lobe pneumonia inevitably because it's behind the heart and people miss it. And if you always look behind the heart for density, increased whiteness. And nowadays with the fact that x-rays are always on a screen, you can fiddle with the light darkness, can't you? So that you can see really clearly. Um, it may be severe, however, and people still die in the UK, children of pneumonia, which is pretty tragic. The commonest complication by far is empyema and a paraneumonic effusion, fluid there. Um, Necrotizing pneumonia being seen more often. I suspect we're over the bump now and actually we're seeing it less now than we were. Pneumatoceles will resolve, leave them alone. 
you need lots of antibiotics and keep the surgeons away whenever possible. That's not to say I might not refer to surgeon in the middle of a, you know, things aren't going well for an opinion, but we really would rather avoid operating at all costs. So that is my slides finished and um, there may be questions, obviously. I move that over there. Ian, that was great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, everybody, I put the um, link for feedback in the chat. If you um, could click on that, that'd be great. Mm. Otherwise, um, if you have got any questions, if you can pop them in the chat and we can put them over to Ian. So Ian, there is one um, that's already there from Sam, who says, do you cover antibiotics with acute mucus plugging and would you expect it to resolve quickly? So I suppose this is these post-op children that have got um, basic Okay, it's a slight because I think the question is about acute mucus plugging. For me, acute mucus plugging happens in bronchiolitis. Um, you know how sometimes a bronchiolitic baby will just suddenly get worse, the sats will drop down, and then there's a lot of coughing and going on and everything, and then things improve. I suspect that's an acute mucus plug. What I'm thinking more of those slides is chronic, you know, it's chronic collapse, in which case, yes, they will go on antibiotics and have physiotherapy. Okay. Asthma with a wedge collapse. That's a tricky one because actually, if you x ray an asthmatic, which as you probably know, you shouldn't really do routinely, you may do the first time they present with a wheeze and then you should, but I'm talking about a known asthmatic, you will get right middle lobe a wedge shaped thing there, which sort of peribronchial thickening um, and mucus plugging. And actually, you need salbutamol for that. I would not immediately start antibiotics because often asthmatics get put on IV antibiotics and that's unnecessarily because someone's done the x-ray in the first place and they then say, oh, look, there's a, I, I don't know if you can see me still, but I'm waving my hand around. There's a kind of wedge-shaped collapse, as you say, and I wouldn't give antibiotics immediately. I would uh, treat with good bronchodilators, et cetera, because that mucus plugging will then be coughed up and will get better. Uh, now, obviously, if it stays there, yes, you can be an asthmatic who's wheezy, who happens to have pneumonia as well. Um, different to normal principles, that is why X-ray. Yeah, well, fair enough. Um, as that's always, we've got shout out for not starting anybody. Well, there you go. You can't win, can you? Um, I, I, honestly, I just, so many times antibiotics are given unnecessarily to people with asthma. I think what I would do is repeat the chest X-ray perhaps 12 hours later or the next morning or something and if it's still down then I start antibiotics. If the child's not got a fever and a wet cough then it's most unlikely this is infection as a primary thing. Right so someone else asked a question on the screener. Um, what's the difference between a pneumatocele and a bulla? A pneumatocele tends to be post um, infection and the bulla to me is neonatal Thing where you've been kind of punished with a ventilator and you've got a localized area of um, almost like an air sac, haven't you? It's not a great answer because that's that's the best I can tell you. But uh, bully tends to be something more in neonatal, neonatal work, to be honest, assuming you've got normal underlying lungs. Blimey. Management of eventuates the diaphragm, that's kind of coming out of left field, completely different topic. Um, okay, I can answer that anyway. Generally, nothing. In other words, firstly, it may be a chance finding. Someone's got a cough, whatever, someone does a chest x-ray, and you see a raised diaphragm on that side. And if a child is otherwise generally a fit, well person, you would leave it alone. Um, but you warn the parents that there's a greater chance of a lower lobe pneumonia on that side because the lower lobe won't expand as easily and mucus may collect, etc. But when you don't ignore it necessarily, is if you have a neonate who is on a ventilator, when you think um, if we operate and do a diaphragmatic plication, it may improve the situation and get the child off the ventilator. And that's something we sometimes see post cardiac surgery. Uh, but on its own, I would leave an inventoration alone generally. Right, I think I've answered all the ones that's on there. Great, thank you. I've got one more. Um, there's always a question with the yeah. post empyema drain patients as to 
when you should follow them up and what when you should x-ray them or whether you should x-ray them what do you do with yours yeah okay right you definitely x-ray them that's the first thing to say no question uh because you need to see what's underlying you need to see that they haven't got a malignancy after all or something else that's not gone away um i would tend to see them at six to eight weeks assuming they're well because if you do it too soon the x-ray will be abnormal and then you'll think oh god i better bring them back and do it again but if you're seeing them at two to three months and by now the x-ray is almost normal and they're well i tend to discharge them particularly because they might live you know often live miles away i'm talking about in the old world as well where you just saw people in clinic um <laughs> but i i would i would not do it too soon we do have some patients though who we will send home they still got a temperature x-rays improve but we've all got bored of the situation they're going mad in hospital and we might bring them back 48 hours later for an x-ray but that's obviously a slightly different situation that's where you almost manage them as an outpatient great that's great thank you very much does anyone else have any questions or are we done i think that's probably it thank you so much for that talk ian it was all fantastic right. Pleasure. Um, all right bye-bye then thank you bye -bye, Thanks, everybody. thank you